Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Super License F1 podcast. My name's Rodney. And my name is Zach. Good to be talking to you via a microphone and the internet in this wonderful day, Zach, that we've just been discussing what we've been up to. I mean, <laughs> lockdown, but you've just had a holiday, so mixed, mixed fortunes, I would say. Yeah, totes mixed, totes mixed. I feel like this is another one of those times when I've managed to sneak, on a hol- sneak away on holiday like I did a couple of times in the second half of last year, just as things were about to get worse again. And I feel like mm. that's maybe where we are. But luckily, we don't have to get ourselves mired in the world's problems. We can talk about Formula One and, and hang out together and bring joy to people via what is it that we're doing today? Another drive to survive, dare to swear. Yeah, we can go back in time to a time before when COVID had been around for a year and a half to a time when it had only been around for about six months and Formula One kicked on and uh, Netflix filmed it with their cameras, made a show out of it called Drive to Survive. We're going to dare to swear over the top. This is season three, episode six, the comeback kid. Now, Zach, uh, I realize that we're at the halfway point of the season, so I just wanted to do a quick halfway point check in, see how you're going with this season. How are you feeling? I... I'm not as like, oh my God, this is the world's most interesting thing, but I've been reflecting on that. And I think it's partly because now we're more familiar with the format. You know, this is halfway through the third season. We get it. There's nothing like the things that might have surprised us, like the access or the swearing in season one and even into season two are the expectation in season three now so we can't I'm, I'm a little bit more like we'll get to the detail uh get to the things that i might not know anything about or have heard anything about um so yeah and look it was a difficult season you know was there that much controversy was there much that much weird stuff happen maybe it was harder for the teams at drive to survive to draw out the narratives um and i think coming into this episode this is again a little bit of a, a character study of one of our performers in formula one as opposed Mm -hmm. to a a a controversy or anything like that how do you feel about it uh i mean i think that i think the season has been uh like lustic compared to the first two Uh, i think you're right that some of the novelty is wearing off but also um i don't know they obviously didn't they obviously had it didn't have as easy a time as they have the other years but i think it's also important to just be like yeah i wasn't really feeling it because if no one says anything then the people are just going to make the same thing again and again and no one's going to actually enjoy it as much as they used to. So um, I think that they need to try a bit harder and I hope they do. Yeah. But in the meantime, it's still okay. Yeah. It's still a great documentary series on a sport that you we love. So I'd rather have it yeah. than not. So if you so wish, dear listener, you can watch along with us. We're going to tell you when to hit play. If you just want to sit back and listen, you can enjoy your, what are people doing? Having a coffee, having a Beer, whiskey, maybe. Mm. You ask Zach. Tell Zach what whiskey you're having if you're having a whiskey right now. Imagine that person is having a whiskey and I say, you're drinking a whiskey. That guy's mind is blown right now. Yeah. Um, we're going to hit play in a sec and then we're going to talk all over the top of this little bitch and then uh, <laughs> we're going to have a good time. I just named myself uh, the first time <laughs> I've made a pour over filter iced coffee um, with the. Oh, with, nice. With uh, James Hoffman, coffee. Uh, expert and aficionado. Um, look him up on mm. YouTube and look for his uh-huh. iced filter coffee recipe. It is delicious. Um, so I'm That's amped great. and I'm ready to go, but now I'm drinkless because it was too delicious. I drank it really fast. <laughs> I, I, I started making iced coffees like the Povo version where you just like make coffee and put ice in it. But uh, I read a thing online that said, you know, some people, the experts will say that when you uh, pour a coffee shot while it's hot over ice cubes, it turns the coffee bitter and you lose some of the flavors. And then there are others who say that that is an absolute crock of shit. So, um, I don't know. I say just do whatever feels good, man. Yeah. Yeah. But experiment. Yeah. Get out there. Try your own shit. It's not hard. That's what you got to do. Just well, All right. You ready? That's, co- that's ice coffee corner handled for another mm-hmm. week. And now we're going to hit play. Okay. Here we go. In three, two, one. Uh-huh. Fantastic. We are off and away. Look at those bright colors. They're so neon. Oh, no. Uh-oh. A this doesn't look good. crashed Gasly in a Red Bull. I've got mm, the subtitles on this time as well, it. so you know that the tense music is playing. Ah, nice. This is, this is all backstory, baby. Yeah. I like hearing about all of Pierre Gasly's uh, background because... That was the weird thing, right? That he was just like, had a couple of bad performances, 
And then Alexander Albon came in and was like, you know what? I had a couple of okay performances. So let's put me in the car. And all of that stuff about the, the photoshopping of, of, uh, mm. Gasly's head off his own body and Alex Albon's head coming in instead because they couldn't go and like, come on, go and take some photos. How hard is it to do that? <laughs> um, and uh, it's interesting because I feel yeah. like we've kind of done this in reverse because last season we got the big Alexander Albon, like, wow, what a great career and driver and switch and change. And now he's not even in Formula One anymore. Like, how crazy is that? Yeah, I think it would be funny if you uh, enjoy Formula One through this show to follow the narratives from season to season because they there is a little bit of an assumed knowledge, I think, going into each season and even each episode that they're like, hmm, forget about the previous years. Uh, we're just going to tell you the story you need to hear for this episode right now. So, so sort of here's the highlights, but don't come in thinking, oh, I can't wait for the Alexander Albon episode. It's like, well, we'll tell you in the first one minute what you're supposed to think about that. Yeah. Remember this guy? Yeah. I did, little did I know kid. watching this kind of the first time uh, that, you know, AlphaTauri have really settled into this, like, we're a fashion brand who just happens to be in Formula One. Um, Daniil Kvyat does not strike me as a guy who cares too much about fashion. Maybe I'm doing him a disservice. But Pierre Gasly has the effortless fashion boy face and so look. So just look of, at their hair right now. Yes. Whose haircut do you think costs more money? Ah, oh, do you know how much it costs to make your hair look like you've done nothing to it? Yeah. And that do you know just... how much money Daniel oh. Kvyat saves every year by cutting his own hair? It's incredible. <laughs> I'm not sure that he ever has to. I think that it's ju- it grew to that length and stopped. And he's <laughs> yeah, never had to chop it. It just stayed <laughs> From there From high school forever. to now. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Pierre Gasly looks like he, it's... Is his hair naturally blonde tipped in that so, way, like a natural yeah. like beach fade? Who knows? Homeless um, chick. Yeah. yeah. Oh, now we're racing. I've got loud noises, the car's moving. This is what mm-hmm. I signed up for. Man, the Alpha Tori looks good uh, in 2020, but it just reminded again. And what, having watched the Alpha Tori just race around Monaco this season, I'm like, God, that car's so nice looking. You love it. I love it. Contrast, simple two colors. Mm, you you love everything about rims. it. Mm. You just love to see it. You do love to see it. I'm not seeing a lot of um, Pierre Gasly's body. Oh, there it is. There we go. Look at that. Top <laughs> half. Too soon. Yeah. Good look. Good fit. Look, when you're a fashion model like these guys are, uh, mm. that's just the life. There's no modesty. You just got to get the shot done. That's. <laughs> Oh, immediate flashbacks to Flight of the Concords, you know, like you could be a part-time model. Yeah. You just probably still have yes. to keep your normal job, but a part-time model. <laughs> okay, we're in Spa. This is, it. again, we get an overhead shot. I could have picked that that was Spa from that shot. Really? You wouldn't have thought it was the Steering Especially that one. From Brie? No, nah, Steering is different. Mm. I think it's less lush. Yep. Spa is just like, man, they must have killed so many trees <laughs> to make this track. Sorry, trees. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, stereo is more like, yeah, there, there was already a clearing, so we just laid down some bitumen. Bitumen. Yeah, Are we ready that, for it? I've got a, I've got a yeah. bitch focus segment whenever you're ready for it. Yeah, go on. This is, uh, this is a new segment called... Um, I would call it Bitch Perfect. And I heard a story today. This is a story that's been going around for a while, but I heard it today. So it's news to me about Bitch. Um, are you familiar with the movie Robocop? I am. A robotic, robotic policeman uh, directed mm-hmm. by Dutchman Paul Verhoeven. I know you've got, you've got a connection with the same name. Not him. The other Paul yep. Verhoeven. And there's a scene where there's, there's this guy and he's, in, he's at home with these two girls. This other guy walks in with a gun and he says, Bitches, leave. And then uh, they were sort of directing that scene, and they didn't. The director didn't realize that "bitches" was like a bad word, so he was just he was like, "Okay, so here's what's going to happen: the guy's going to come in with his gun, he's going to say "bitches leave," and then "bitches, if you bitches could just leave, you get your little bitch purse, and they just walk out the door and go on with your bitch life." And they're like, "What the fuck, dude? <laughs> Why are you talking to us like that?" He just didn't realize what the word even meant. Great, pretty good story. Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. So we're getting behind the scenes here of Alpha Tauri. This is, I mean, you wanted behind the scenes action and we're getting it. And it's lots yeah. of lots of marketing, PR instructions and drivers just looking thrilled at their obligations. Yes. Um, well, I mean, that's a, 
that's a, no. a topical thing, right? With Naomi Osaka essentially pulling yeah, out of true. Roland Garros this this week because of the, her choosing not to, not wanting to do um, press conferences. Um, there's a great piece by Jonathan Liu in the Guardian, the UK Guardian, who he's usually a football reporter, I'm pretty sure, but he wrote a great piece about how maybe the problem, maybe the, the journalists are the bad guys, or maybe not the goodies. Uh, the idea that press conferences are kind of a broken set up because you just get, especially for individual sports people like tennis players who just have to come in after they've just played, you know, high on emotion and just get asked the most banal, inane questions of like, so good to win or crap to lose. Mm. And it just does nothing. Um, and it may, he made a very good point that, well, the sports people can talk directly to their audience now via social media, through their own channels, that kind of thing. And those press conferences offer up basically nothing to anybody. Um, so maybe if you're going to continue to have them, the journalists could ask maybe better questions. Um, but then the <laughs> argument against that is always like, well, it's just part of your job as a sports person that you have to go and do all of these press stuff. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting for Formula One drivers because they are part of a team. God, Alexander Albon, watching him shave, it's just the roughest thing. Yeah. Oh, it's like, my dude, God. Use some cream, man. And just oh. like go slowly, nice slow, oh. even. Oh man, don't stab just it. Chop, chop, oh, chop. Why is he stabbing at himself like that? Well, it's because he's, um, he's, uh, he's, because he's like only the guy 17 years who, old. He's his sport director guy. He's not getting any help from that guy. Yeah, he's got the biggest beard possible. Anyway, <laughs> my, right. I was just going to finish anyway, my thought, which is on. that um, Formula One teams, because they're teams and their drivers are sponsored and all that kind of stuff their obligations are very much part of their contract. Whereas if you're an individual sports person, like a tennis player or a golfer, you are, yes, under some obligation by the uh, event that you're a part of. But in the end, it's uh, you, there's nowhere for you to hide, unfortunately. There's no team to hide behind. There's no like PR person who can, on behalf of the team, who will say yes or no, that's appropriate or mm. not. It's just like, no, you're in it. Not to say their sports people don't have those people in, in their entourages, but it is... I think it's kind of well within the right of the person who is literally providing the show, the entertainer, you know, the sports person to be like, that's a dumb question. Or I don't want to do this today to protect my mental health. I think that's fine because it's not like you, I don't think we learn anything from those press conferences anyway, because the questions are, the questions are stupid. And maybe that's something that Drive to Survive actually does pretty well, which is that it does seem to ask some of the harder questions, um, which is why you get Toto Wolf swearing at the camera being like, hey, fuck off, because... I don't think they are hiding anything mm. um, or trying to avoid too much in Drive to Survive and maybe in Formula One, which is maybe why we find this show so interesting because it's a little less managed than mm. maybe Formula One is used to. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, and no, no, I agree. I, I think Formula One's gone through this as well where it's like, hey, man, why are these press conferences so, like, boring and just crap and they go on forever and ever? No one even likes being here. This is just garbage. Um I think it's time in sport that we have a conversation about, you know, elevating mental health to be the, on the same level as physical health. That's an important thing we need to think about. Yep. Absolutely right. The quality and, and in, in the motivation and intention of questions needs to be brought into question. On the other hand, I think there's lots of obligations on any professional sports person. One of them is doing press conferences, so it doesn't seem unreasonable. Everybody has to do them. And this person, uh, it, it seems, has had like some kind of a history of um, struggling in the mental health side, which is sad. And I hope that she gets all the support and she deserves all the support and it should be the, the sport and it should be the media that's supporting her. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any easy answer. I don't know what it is, but we can, we, everyone could do better, it seems. Um, yeah. and I mean, the thing is just hopefully we get to a point where there's a bit more sensitivity around that issue and we, uh, come up with better allowances. I don't know that it's necessarily, the solution to just say, well, if you don't feel like doing an interview, just don't do one. Because then every, everyone that doesn't want to feel like doing one won't do one. Like everyone that loses a game won't, won't, won't want to do one. It's We need some mediation. I just don't know what, what the right mediation is. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting though, because I think what you, what you, you're right there in that if you don't, there's a difference between I don't feel like doing one, I'm under no obligation to do one, go away, uh, versus... I'm definitely not up to this and it's doing me damage. You know, this is a really good example. Here's Pierre Gasly putting flowers down at Antoine's, you know, Antoine who bears the point where he had his crash and, and, and died. Uh, I don't think 
drive to survive are like at that moment being like, now give us your reaction. How are you feeling right now? Like, no, they're giving him his mm. space. Like he's going through grief. I don't think anybody would have said at that on that weekend or even the rest of the season been like, Hey, Pierre, you're actually under obligation from the sport and from the media to answer very direct questions about your personal life. Um, so please answer them, you know? And it, so, yeah, you're right. I think that you kind of, it has to be on a scale somewhere. Um, and I think I mean, sport the, the media generally though, is struggling with yeah. that. The media needs to do better. I mean, there's no question, oh, yeah. but I mean, uh, I know at least in Formula One, there is, you know, there's people in the room who are sort of running things kind of, um, if things get really out of control or are deemed to have gotten out of control, there is someone there to step in and be like, yeah, okay, enough of that. We're done. We're going to, we're not going to answer that one or keep going or whatever. You yeah. don't see them that much because it, it doesn't really, I don't know. There's a very passive approach to it, mm. but, uh, yeah, no, I totally agree. If someone is like bored with questions or thinks questions are mean or whatever, they're perfectly within their right to sit there and go, man, that's a mean question. Why would you talk to someone like that? I'm a human being with feelings. Yeah. Uh, but obviously some, when someone's wounded, they're not going to do that, are they? Well, you'd hope so. It's a, I think that there's a, a very interesting broader discussion to be had about how sport, it's almost like you, you, I don't think you can put all sports in the same one sport category. Like Formula One is entertainment first and foremost. There is no, you know, we've, I've, brought this up multiple times. I actually don't think people have very strong allegiances to their, to their Formula One teams because they change ownerships. They Yes, they have racing history, but it's not like they have even like staff history too much or driver history. You know, there's no like father-son, well, there is a little bit of father-son approach in Formula One these days. Um, uh, a couple of drivers right now, actually. But um, I don't think that people necessarily feel overall the, gen- the same affinity for a specific like driver or personality or team or something like that, that you might get in like broader team sports. Like they, they also lack the, you know, like, like big team sports are often like there's a, something about the like geographical location of a thing of a sporting team. And then you like that has a, a certain relationship draw for somebody. So formula one and especially something like drive to survive is one big package now. It kind of needs journalists less and less and less because they're like, well, we'll tell the public what the sport is. Like, we'll communicate directly with the audience. You know, I don't think that people who are watching Drive to Survive necessarily are reading Motorsport and Autosport the next weekend or the same day. They're like, I can, I can basically take Formula One wholly from the Formula One group. Like, I can mm. buy my coverage from Formula One TV. I can read all of the news Put on Formula One.com. garbage commentary. Yeah, with garbage commentary, and I can watch Drive to Survive. And I yeah, can exactly. hear directly from the drivers and teams on their social media and on their own video channels on YouTube or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where does a journalist fit here? I think that's, where does part, the media? I think that's it. I think it's fighting fire with fire. I think that's mm. if saying, look, I think, I think press conferences are completely boring, so I'm just going to sit there and twiddle my thumbs and give banal answers. But then guess what? When I'm on TikTok, I'm going to be like doing mm. dances. I'm going to be doing whatever. If that's what you think is the best solution, then, then great. Maybe your solution is no social media. <laughs> Maybe your solution is you sit in the press conference and say as few words as possible. It's worked for the Finns for 30 years. So Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah exactly. Look, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if, I, I think um, the problem, the, the, the question more, I think, is are, are, are the people being protected the way they need? And mm. it doesn't necessarily just mean, um, you know, helmets and, you know, neck safety. It's, it's what's between the ears as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. And this is interesting, you know, I think Drive to Survive is interesting because it it it's suits Formula One right now for teams and drivers to tell their stories kind of themselves through this. But then there is also you know, I mean this is this episode is a great opportunity for Pierre Gasly to tell the world uh his story from his viewpoint. And this doesn't have journalists asking like trying to get the inside scoop on him, which means it's like, it's a little bit F1 propaganda. Um, and they, they add a level of authenticity by trying, by having someone like Jenny Gao, um, ostensibly as like a, well, this is the independent, uh, objective read on that same situation. Um, and I think, you know, the journalists on the show do a very good job of, of showing that. Um, but again, that's still just, this is all media managed no teams really like i don't think this show does a bear, does a job of like showing any team every team has their own redemption story in this show you never mm. left at the end of an episode being like yeah. well that team's fucked and they're really horrible and they suck yeah. and i hate them now like it's all See, like you know, everyone is one big product 
True. Here's an interesting question for you. Is this a reality show? I think this is a reality show as much as something like Keeping Up With The Kardashians is a reality show. As much as? Yeah. I think it's written. The only thing that is not is the recorded, like, every now and again you see a little bit of, especially around the weekends, the teams kind of forget they're being recorded because they have to, they're doing Mm. their jobs. Like, they're actually, it's not fake jobs. This is a real race that's actually happening. Uh, yeah, whereas, right. like, if it's keeping up with the Kardashians and it's like, we went, we did this launch of a new drink. And it's like, well, that yeah. was maybe wholly done for the show. Whereas this race... That's, is, that's is what real. I was going to say, I think, is the difference. Is that there's, there's, there's like, there's a manufactured outcome or mm. just window dressing that can be artifice. So, I think this show is, is like, genuine on the outcome, the racing outcomes, and then the people's stories mm-hmm. with a lot of artifice around the surface. Whereas reality TV is like... We have scripted everything that's going to happen in this episode. There might be a surprise. Things may not go exactly to plan, but we kind of know, like, we have characters. We're going to present them in certain ways, and Mm. we're going to encourage people to act in certain ways to bring out their character more. We're going to, you know, it's like wrestling, basically. It's all, yeah. it is all step-by-step planned out, and it may not always go to plan, but at least there is a plan. This seems to be a lot more, well... You know, we probably know that Spa's going to be an emotional race for, for Gasly. We probably know that, you know, we're going to follow Ferrari when they're in Italy, that kind of thing. But beyond that, it's like, let's see what happens at the race. Mm. It's, I would say maybe then it's a caricaturized version of Formula One. Like, I think yeah, Drive sure. to Survive, especially here, and we've, we've mentioned this before, you know, here we are at Spa talking about like, well, Albon did badly and... Um, Pierre Gasly did really well. So that's obviously a big, ten- a really big tension point. I don't think at the time we were like, oh, well, just swap them right back. Um, because we know that the sport doesn't work mm, that pretty way. Sure you but said I think that. this, yeah, probably, I probably did. <laughs> but <laughs> we also, this, I don't th- necessarily think, I, I think Drive to Survive does a very good job of like giving with one hand, taking with the other. You know, they, they'll tell you bits about how the sport works and kind of tell you how it should work when it suits the narrative. But mm. then because of the way it mucks around with time, it can sometimes make it seem like, well, this driver had one bad race and look, they'll replace the next week. It's like, that's not how it went down. That's definitely not how <laughs> it went down. That was like no. this driver had six months of bad races yeah, and that happened to be someone chances. who was performing well. And they undenied for a while. And yes, this team does it like this, but no other team does it like that. You know, there's... Uh, it's all, it's all edited and cut together to create a narrative that sometimes definitely, well, not sometimes, most of the time didn't happen like that. Mm. It still happened, but it didn't happen in that way. Everything's condensed and packaged up into a 35-minute story. Mm. Yeah, like even this, like this Christian Horner talking, um, with the media, you know, that was, you're not going to get anything out of that. Of course, he's going to be like, yep, here goes Lee performed well, well. Yeah. You know the answers before you ask the question. You really just mm. need him to say the words so that you can quote him mm-hmm. and then say, see, here it is. Like I, like yeah. I suggested, you know, you can, you can pre-write the headline really before, before you even talk to him because you, you sort of know, like, I mean, especially journalists are really good at asking these questions that are like, well, either way. If you say yes or no, it's going to be a great headline for me. So, and I think you're probably going to say yes, but even if you say no, even better. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's what that's what takes the spontaneity out of it, the excitement out of it, the character out of it. And that's just why, you know, it's just so predictable. And I mean, that's why you sort of feel for people who aren't performing in a specific way that they're going in battling that and then you know when they don't perform oh man i've got to do now a thousand interviews where everyone says why why didn't you win why are you losing why aren't you Mm. winning and i have to to answer all their questions with a smile because if i don't i'll look like a jerk but that must be tough man yeah it's also i don't think formula one is necessarily a sport with too many scoops that might sound weird but like at least in the last feels like for me the last decade like you're not performing here because your car's what's, not very good. Like what's the scoop? And the guys Give who are winning scoop from another another sport. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, what is a scoop what's from the, another sport? You know, what's the last scoop could, that comes to mind? Um, from another sport, 
another big scoop. Uh, that's a good point. You know, uh, I, I just, I'm just trying to work out. Like, yeah, I mean, there was a, about... there's, you know, a little bit of a scoop recently, I suppose, for my football club, Arsenal Football Club, where you know one of the players, just the captain, turned up late. Um, and it was like his third offense. And so they had to like, like the manager just kept him on the bench. And so we didn't know going into that match necessarily why that was the case, but some mm, investigative journalists yeah, right. who had their sources found out like, it's like, well, cause he's, he's, you know, late or misbehaving or these kinds of things. And it kind of gave you some insight into the internal workings and management process, that kind of stuff. But in formula one, it's kind of, it, it, it run the race weekends run to a script. It's really, really, really well formula, right? Like it's formulaic. And so we tend to know, like, if a team is underperforming or maybe overperforming, like Ferrari was in 2019, and it was like, well, was it 2019, 2020? I can never remember. But it's like, they were doing really well, and nobody really knew why, and then it turned out they were cheating. I suppose that's a scoop. Was it, like, a kind of? Like, there's a little bit of breaking news, I suppose. But generally speaking, if a team's really good, we know why. It's because their car's really good. And they have some good drivers. And if a team's crap, it's because their car's crap. And there's no, sco- I don't think there's any scoop there. I don't think mm. that even recently in the last weekends where we've been like, oh, it's the flexible wings. Oh, it's all going to hit the fan when the w- turns out the teams who are using flexi wings aren't approved and that's bad. I don't think that's the reason why they're doing really well or really like not well. I don't think it's like they've got a fan on the bottom of the car sucking it to the ground. It's just like, yeah, those flexi wings are maybe giving them a tiny little bit of advantage, but I don't think it's enough for them to like dominate the championship. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. yeah. Maybe there aren't scoops in Formula One anymore because we're all, or, or in sport generally, because we get a huge amount of information about everything that's happening all the time. Now, it's not like the only way we got to view the sport is you were either there in the ground yeah. or at the track or... The journalists told you what happened. It's just like, See, no, this, every team is talking all the time. This came up on Twitter recently where I think it was really the, maybe during the race or practice or something last race, um, they were talking about the how we used to have ultra hard tires. And I tweeted like, oh, my God, don't even talk oh, to me yeah, about ultra so hard tires. I don't want that. Just tell me again, is it a hard, medium or soft? That's all I've ever wanted to know. And I think a few people retweeted it. A few people weighed in and they were like, oh, I liked knowing whether it was step six or step five. Like, okay, hmm. if, if, I mean, you get, then you get bombarded with enough information. Don't you actually just want what matters rather than a million data points and then understanding it all and going, I'm a brain genius. I worked it all out. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, the, like, spare a thought for the kid watching Formula One. He's not going to get into the sport because he doesn't understand it because it's too complicated. And remember that you were a kid one day. That's why it's got to be easy. Yeah. I mean, Formula One is that, that's the classic tension for the sport as a product, as an entertainment product, is how much is too much information, you yeah. know, and how much as a commentator, as a, as a special guest or a host, how much information do you actually want to give, you know, because all mm. those people who want that level of detail can go and get it, you know, it's not yeah. like it's being hidden, it's available, you can go and find it. Um, it's when people kind of get annoyed. It's like, well, this is actually what makes the sport. Like, this is why it's interesting. It's like, well, I actually don't think it's up to people to decide what makes something interesting for other people. You know, if I find, if I, the only reason I watch the sport is because I think the cars look cool driving around the track, then that (laughs) should be okay. Like, that's fine. Or if I watch the sport because I like Pierre Gasly and maybe when he leaves the Formula One, I'm going to be less interested in the sport. That's also okay too. You know, there is no right way to enjoy the things that you like, you know? Um, or for somebody to tell you, it's like, you're not, <laughs> you're not enjoying this the right way. Yeah, you're, you're not eating your wrong. ice cream correctly. <laughs> you use a teaspoon. That's wrong. You should be using a ladle. That's the only way to eat ice cream. Um, it's, yeah, I find that kind of stuff a bit bullshit. And we, you have more information than ever before about what's happening in the sport, you know, uh, in all sports, you know, we, the fact that we even have, you know, you can watch the entire race from Pierre Gasly's point of view if you want, <laughs> Like we are now. You can like, watch Alex and eat shit if you want. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, I brought a swearing yeah. story to the table. What have you got? A swearing story to the table? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little story, I'm a little factoid, factoid about the robotic policeman. Where's your, where's your swear anecdote? Your swear anecdote. Oh, my, my, my swear anecdote. Um, hmm. I have been watching... Um, uh, Gordon Ramsay's you know, Gordon Ramsay, right? Famous for mm-hmm. his swearing. He's a big time swearer. Big time swearer, right? 
And so he's done a show with National Geographic that you can watch on mm-hmm. Disney Plus, which is like Gordon Ramsay Uncharted. And he goes to, you know, wilderness places and learns about the cooking, the, the, the um, traditional cooking methods of those mm-hmm. areas. Now, that show is more bleeps than any other show I've ever watched. And I wow. really wondered why Disney and National Geographic were like, we make shows that, have, that are family friendly that have no swearing. Why they picked him for that show, and also why they didn't just tell him, hey, man, turn the swearing down. If you're going to pick him, at least say, like, hey, this is not a sweary show. Can you just use different words or don't say anything? But he just absolutely refuses to, and it's almost Mm. an awkward tension the entire time. It would be, you know, I know there's some swearing in this show, but I don't think Formula One ever tell the drivers, like, hey, could you not swear on the radio? Because they actually want it in in Drive to Survive, yeah, um, absolutely. And I don't think they would have that kind of power over the teams and and the product, all that kind of stuff. Um, you got to really. So protect. yeah, there's my sweary story. That's a good story. You got to protect that. And um, I remember a while ago that like Charlie Whiting was saying something like, "Oh, you know, if if you if you don't want to be watching the drab, boring press conferences, what you really want to be be shooting is my uh, drivers' uh, conferences." That we do every Friday or whatever, Mm. because that's when you get people really talking about fun stuff and they show more of their character. And it's like, yeah, that's cool, except until as soon as you bring the cameras in and the first time someone like gets called out for being some kind of noob or a dickhead or something, everyone's going to like clam up as soon as the cameras walk in and it's going to be exactly the same thing. It's just not the problem isn't what room are we sitting in? The problem is what happens when I show my personality and it's maybe not so great or not perfectly manicured. And what's the flow and effect? And then, you know, you're going to become guarded all the time. So you either need to revel in those unguarded moments, which is what this show, I guess, is. That's that's the that's the promise of this show. That's why you would watch it, right? So, um, yeah. yeah, you just, you got to guard that a bit. Yeah. I also think that this show, we've talked about it before, that um, the main characters in this show are all in a position of privilege. Because there's nothing you can say, not nothing, most of the things that these drivers can say in their piece to cameras, uh, their little interviews, all that kind of stuff, they're not going to get fired from most of that mm. stuff, right? If they were like, yeah, I fucking, I, you know, if Daniel Ricardo was like, you know what, I don't fucking suck. That was so dumb of them to <laughs> hire me. Like, they're paying me so much money and I'm just going to leave. Like, they would probably fire him that day um, or sue him or something like that uh, for, for libel or something, you know, who knows. But. Yeah, you know, most of these drivers can be like, oh, I feel like I'm, you know, the team's not giving me that much attention or like I feel like I'm in a really rough spot and that my co-driver gets more attention, that kind of thing. They're not going to fire you for that. So everybody, most of the people on the show can speak with a, a sense of independence and freedom. I think they don't necessarily stick to like the team party PR lines. If anything, half this show is PR managers being like, could you wear your mask correctly? Or could you not say that <laughs> next time maybe? Or could you announce that at a different time on your own personal social media? That would be really good. Like they have, they have hard jobs, the PR mm. managers at these teams. Um, so, so what you're yeah, saying is we, a little bit less Greg Russell and a bit, bit more Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, exactly. But your point is so sound that if, yeah, if, Drive to Survive just records literally every single behind closed doors chat. Then we're going to like all of those people will be on guard and they won't really say, and they'll just find different ways. They'll find different times off camera to really say it. Um, and you're right. I think the gold dust of this show is, well, there's a race weekend and they all forget that the cameras are there because they're busy doing their jobs. They can't think about the cameras. They literally have to think about like, how do I win this race? Mm. So Pierre Gasly is going to do incredibly well here. He's going to take his first win. We saw earlier Leclerc crash, and I'm trying to remember whether we've seen the race that focuses on Ferrari or not, because it, I know I've seen the series, yes. the series before. Yeah. Did we see that one? Is that like a flashback, or is this a flash forward yeah. now, or flash sideways? No, we had a Ferrari. We had a whole Ferrari episode two. Did it cover ago. this one though, where, where Leclerc crashed? I can't remember. Mm, Maybe it did. I possibly. do remember watching the series and it yeah, showed it Monza, twice. Right? And the second, yeah, this the is whole thing that the second time Ferrari they showed it, I was well. like, "That's so good that it's a, a flashback." And we've already covered that incident, so we know what happened. Mm. Um, I don't remember though. Obviously, they were like, "Well, this is the one where Gasly wins." Like, we'll show it, but we're not we're not cutting away from him. We're going to use every little bit of him yes. whenever we've got. I think that's what they did. I think they sh- kind of showed that Ferrari had a bad a bad run at Monza. Mm. Uh, and then they just didn't really talk about it much more. 
we do we are kind of building i mean in in a way formula one got so lucky and this series got so lucky that there were lots of eventful things towards the end of the season like pretty much when the Mm. season was a dead rubber it was still incredibly like the most dramatic things happened right at the end so we are kind of building to that in terms of the series but uh this is i guess the midway uplifting story about i guess you call him an underdog they've already set up that he got dumped from red bull so um, I guess this is as close as we get to like the underdog come good story of the season. So, uh, this is yeah. the midway, we're at the hump, the midway hump, and this is going to help you get through to those other episodes. But I mean, every driver feels like has been some, has either been part of the Red Bull program or been dumped by Red Bull. At some yeah. Point. Wasn't there a race recently that was like, oh yeah, everyone in the top six has raced at Red Bull at one point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, they just go through drivers, and they and because they're the only team yeah. willing to try, like young drivers, like really young drivers. I shouldn't say they're not the only team, but you know, they blood them young at Toro Rosso, mm. Alpha Tori, Red Bull. Um, so yeah, your career's not done if you don't if your con- if your contract isn't continued yeah. by Red Bull. Well, they cycle through another a team in will a short pick you up. Period. Yeah, yeah, and the good ones find find roles somewhere. There's only two spots in the senior team, and that's that's Pierre Gasly's problem. You know, that he's actually very, 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 very good, uh, as this race shows. Like, this was incredible for an Italian team to win at Monza, and I love that. I just love how emotionally he is. Uh, And he's just so appreciative. Like, when this happened, I was like, fuck yeah, man, so good for you. (laughs) (laughs) Like, he's, he's hard not to really like. And look, yeah, he's got a little bit of arrogance about him, but they all do. And... You know, we like the Honda story and we like the Alpha Tori story, you know, good on him. Um, and it's all, I think it's tough for Alpha Tori, previously Toro Rosso, because they know that, like, if anybody's good, they're going up to Red Bull. Like, it must be really rough for them to know that, like, well, if anybody achieves at any moment, they're going into the big team. Yeah. Um, and it could be that at some point that Alpha Tori just kind of, if anything, they're moving more and more away from Red Bull from a brand perspective. And I think if you were totally new, to Formula One and you didn't watch a show like this and you only necessarily followed along with highlights or even on the race weekends, you might not necessarily be like, oh, they're they're not just like a little bit sponsored by Red Bull. Those they're actually yeah, owned by yeah. Red Bull. I don't think you would necessarily know you that. You wouldn't know that. You just think they're some great like midfielder team that like, you know, mm. like overcomes. They're the hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's not a lot of Red Bull branding other than the oh, little no. bull in no, the logo. Barely anything. Yeah. Really good showing from Red Bull, though, to stand there and applaud them all and just, like, I mean, you know, people sort of dump on Red Bull sometimes for being, like, soulless or, like, heartless. But, I mean, Mm. you know, they have their moments. Yeah, definitely. Well, because that's it. In the end, they want to win races. You know, because that's one of the best things about Red Bull is that they are, they're an energy drink. And so, uh, Matrix Data Ship, what's the guy's name? Matterschitz. Matterschitz. Dietrich Matterschitz, the Red Bull CEO and owner of the drinks brand, the whole thing, is always being like, hey, if you don't win, we're out. Like, this yeah. is a marketing. Bitches you're you're a marketing department. We'll just bail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, Christian Horner, whilst he's in a position of privilege, is also someone who's like, well, this whole thing could go away at any moment. Yeah. It feels like, you know, they might just Absolutely. at the end of the season be like, you know what? It's too <laughs> weird for us. Like, it's not green enough, the sport. Yeah. We're not making enough money. Like, Goodbye. Come on. Get real. They're doing their best to make it look like there's people there, but there's no one there. Like, this is really, <sighs> like, this is gutting. When the, those shots of Pierre Gasly sitting up on that mm. rostrum and then, like, the empty pit straight, like, I mean, the empty main straight, like, oi, oh yeah. boy. Good race. Just generally that one. There's, yeah, this is a good one. Carlos Sainz in second. Would have been nice for him. At the time, do you remember who you were going for? Did you want Carlos Sainz to win? Did you want Pierre to win? Uh, I think, wasn't it really close? Wasn't wasn't Sainz closing yeah. up on him? And I remember thinking, yeah. I don't really care. I don't care who wins. This is like, not only is this a great like finish in terms of two drivers closing in on each other, don't, I, don't, I don't mind which one of these wins because I'll be happy. Yeah. And it's also nice. That's, that is often the nice thing with Formula One, yeah. right? That even if he got overtaken... It you would know, have been a great yeah, achievement. Still would have but finished not on the podium. This. That's a nice consolation. God, it's only his third season in F one at this point. I forgot that. Like, it feels like Pierre Gasly's been around for ages because he had a pretty. It's been all narrative with Pierre Gasly, right? In great up, probably too early, back mm-hmm. out again, replaced mm-hmm. by someone who's not in F one anymore. Like, it's yeah. what a career. 
I mean, he's done more than a whole bunch of other drivers have in three years. Hmm. Well, That's it. we did it. I feel like I barely episode. talked about that episode. Yeah, well, you know, they can't all be singers, at least not from us anyway. Uh, that's another, another episode of Drive to Survive Dunsky. Um, so, I mean, where do we, what are we now? We're at the start of June. So we're going to be, uh, getting through this season pretty soon, which is good? Question mark? Yeah. Yeah, it is yeah. a good question mark. I think so. Yeah, well, that, that'll mean we'll have some shakedown episodes at some point. Um, yeah, that's true. Season, we'll, which is we'll always still nice. Which is too. where more of my, like, what is the product of F1 chat probably would have fit better in. Um, <laughs> but, right. you know, but then also we'll get through this point. season and you'll, everyone will get a bit of a break before like, you know, the next season hits us basically. So, uh, yeah. and it's, I think it'd be hard to juggle too many seasons in your head, like the current season we're doing, mm. the current season we're mm. watching in TV and TV land. So yeah. Anyway, probably in the next, I don't know how many are left. There's four. You probably say in the next couple of months we'll be done with, done with drive yeah. to survive. But, uh, yeah. It's been, I think I'm enjoying this. I think it's good. Yeah, so do I. We got, um, yeah, we got four more episodes to go. We've got Baku coming up this Mm. weekend. The Castle Race, Azerbaijan. The Castle Um, Race, yes. Bowser's Castle. mm Mm-hmm. That'll be lovely. And then we've got a break till the French Grand Prix. So that'll be season three, episode seven of Dare to Swear, Drive to Survive, um, after Azerbaijan. So something to look forward to there. There you go. Because the runaway success of Dare to Swear means people are skipping the race episodes and just listening to this. Incredible. Well, who would have thunk what? it? Who have would we, have thunk it? I think it's Baku, week break, and then do we have a triple header? I think we go France. Isn't it double? Yeah, France and then double Austria. Austria Although then, Austria, yeah. who knows? That's yeah. what we're waiting to see. Yeah, that's three. I've got the schedule up right now. Yeah, mm. so we, we have a race on the 20th, the 27th. And the fourth, three race weekends in a row. Hold on to your your marbles, guys. That's a lot of racing. Uh, there will at some point be time. a summer break, though. So uh, I believe it's mm. as many as three weeks in August. So, yeah, one way or another, we'll finish this season or it'll finish us. Um, yeah, yeah, Baku's coming up. Lots of, I don't know, what's happening in the championship is still pretty close. So if that's your thing, get excited for that, I suppose. Don't forget to get your picks in for fantasy. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. We're at Superlicense. Check out our website at superlicense.com.au. Send us an email at superlicensepodcast at gmail.com. Do we want to throw out a, a tease about F1 Dreams? Anyone have an F1 Dream? You can always send us an email and we will read it out on the show when we get a handful of F1 Dreams. I bet you've had an F1 Dream lately. Yes. Yeah, you, Whiskey uh, Man. Yeah, I did have an F1 dream. I had, I had that galling moment where I had it early in the night, woke up, and I was like, that was an F1 dream. I should write that down. <laughs> that was an F1 dream. Straight back to sleep. And oh, then woke up in the morning. Like, pretty sure I had F1. Yeah, I did. Oh, you got to bottle that. Go- you got to you know, bottle the lightning um, when you have it. So always, even if it's just a voice memo into your phone and it's mm. two in the morning. You can absolutely send us a voice memo. It's been a while since we've played anyone's voices other than ours on the show. <laughs> so absolutely feel free. If you want to record yourself re- reciting your F1 dream, send it in. Otherwise, send us an email. It's probably the next best one. Superlicensepodcast.gmail.com with your F1 dream. And when we get a bunch of them, we'll do a segment. Maybe on one of these, maybe on a race episode. Who knows? You just never know your luck in this crazy old world of podcasting. Anything else that you want to cover off today, Zach? No, I just hope everybody, if you can get vaccinated, please do get vaccinated. Yes, great Play great it safe idea. out there. I hope that everybody is, if you're in lockdown or if you've got restrictions or whatever it is, be safe, look after each other, call your family, <laughs> say hi. Um, <laughs> say hi from and me. And if you're... <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, yeah, exactly. And if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and the weather's lovely, get outside. Yeah. Go to the park. You Do know, a thing. Look at some fun puppies. Um, I know that's what I'm going to be doing after this call. <laughs> Quick stroll, check on the puppies at the park. Um, and then oh, look the park forward pups. to Baku. Yeah, park pups. Hashtag park pups. You can that's listen right. to my other show, Park Pups. Park Pups. It's hard to that's say, but it's great. easy to listen to. Well, Zach, I think we've done a great job this week, as always. Uh, again, lots of, lots of really exciting and great episodes of Drive to Survive to come. So, uh, hopefully the racing is good. Hopefully the TV commentaries are good. Hopefully you're good as well. And we'll wrap it up there. Yep. Sweet. My name's been Rod. Until next time, we'll talk to you later. And again, my name's been Rod. <laughs> <laughs> my name's been Zach. You're going to let me One say my name? God. I won't fuck up my outros. Anyway, thanks, buddy. Thanks for listening. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next week for Baku. Bye bye. Bye-bye.
rip it. You can do it. No, no, no. Tines. Okay. Oh, yeah! <laughs> the big effort one. Yeah. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> That's strange.